game is underway. Kickoff is high, very deep, out of the end zone, over the crossbar, and Auburn will start first and 10 at the 20-yard line. Robinson really got everything into that one. He kicked it all the way over the crossbar, and so Auburn will start first and 10 at the 20-yard line. That's a real plus ball for Georgia's defense to have a very potent Auburn offense on the 20-yard line instead of about the, uh, the 30 or 35. Uh, which would probably have happened if James Brooks would have had the opportunity to return that ball. Byron Franklin wide left. No tight end for Auburn. Bird and Robbins move right. Auburn in the eye formation for Charlie Trappin. And now he's changing his signal at the line. Long count for Charlie Trappin. Gives inside the cribs. Hit and knocked down as he got to the line of scrimmage. Maybe up to the 21 or 22 yard line and that's all. Cribbs got the carry right in the center of the line and found very little running room. It'll be a gain of two, second down eight at the 22-yard line. It's quite obvious, Paul, that Georgia's excited. Their defense uh, got up applauding and jumping all over the place. They're excited today. Robinson Atkins move wide left. Franklin wide right on second down eight. Again, Trockman changing his play at the line of scrimmage. Georgia with only four men on the line of scrimmage right now. They fake it inside. Trappin keeps 25. He's at the 30. He's at the 35. And he is finally knocked down at the 36-yard line. Charlie Trackman kept it on the option, took it outside after faking the cribs and found a crease in the Georgia defense, ran for first down yardage up to the 36-yard line. The strong safety, Jeff Hip, came around to knock him down. That was a little different front on the part of the Georgia defense. They've been lining up with eight on the line of scrimmage with uh, their five defensive linemen and three linebackers, a rover back included in that eight, but uh, we didn't see about uh, five or six guys on the line of scrimmage that time. They marked Trotman down at the 37. First down, Auburn. They're up. Double wide outs right. Single wide out. Franklin is left. Trotman again moves out. Gives to Brooks. Finds running room at the 40 and knocked down as he got to the 41-yard line. James Brooks found a little crease off their right side as they ran a counter play. Terry, Gordon Terry, the end, knocked him down as he came back through. They'll mark him down at the 42-yard line. Gain of five, second down five for the Auburn Tigers. I think the reason that Auburn is not playing with the tight end, they're trying to spread this Georgia defense out, and they're doing with uh, doing that with the three wide receivers in the ball game. Auburn is up. Again, double wide out right, single wide out. Franklin to the left. I formation on second down five. Trotman moves right on the option. He gives inside to Cribs, and Cribs is knocked down. He got to the 43, and that's all gain of one. Third down four coming up for the Auburn Tigers as they ran into the meat of the Georgia defense and middle linebacker Frank Ross, uh, left guard Eddie Weaver were there for the Bulldogs. Phil? Two carries for Joe Cribbs, only three yards. They remember well he ran for 250 against them last year, and I'm sure they've set a lot of their defense for Mr. Joe Cribbs today. Rusty Bird and Mark Robbins are wide right. Byron Franklin wide left, no tight end for Auburn. Third down four at the 43-yard line. Just underway, no score at Athens Sanford Stadium. Trotman moves out right on the counter option. Pitches to Brooks at the 40. Brooks is hit, and Brooks is, gets away and then is thrown at the 43-yard line. Brooks was hit first in the backfield by the linebacker, the rover man, Pat Collins. He got away from Collins, but the pursuit caught up. And so Auburn is going to face a punting situation. One thing, Paul, they did move the ball out nearly to midfield, so they will not give up field position on the uh, exchange of the ball. Scott Werner, the sophomore, the rather the junior from Jonesboro, is deep. Skip Johnston in punt formation at the Auburn 28-yard line. Georgia shifting the line. Skip gets his kick away. It is a low line drive spiral. Warner is going to field it on the run at the 23. He is hit, gets away at the 25, and knocked down at the 27-yard line. Got away for a moment. Bob Harris hit him first and knocked him off balance. And then Rusty Bird came over to finish him off. A 34-yard kick for Skip Johnston. Georgia will start first and 10. It's a penalty against Georgia, holding against Georgia. Well, let's see. Let's see. If I don't is, see a marker, but all the officials are back yes, up sir. at the line of scrimmage, and they're walking Auburn off. They're walking off across midfield, and it appears that Auburn is going to get the ball back on a big penalty. They mark the penalty all the way down to the Georgia 42-yard line, and we'll see what the official signal is. I never saw a flag. Apparently, they held somebody up at the line, huh? That's the signal holding, so Auburn gets a big break. Tigers have the ball first and 10 at the Georgia 42-yard line. As we noted last week, uh, this is uh, something that's been a very detrimental factor against Auburn's offense. It, uh, it's good to see it uh, happen on the other side of, of the uh, line of scrimmage. Atkins and Robbins move wide left. That's the wide side of the field. Franklin is wide right. 
Eye backfield for Trappin on first down at the 42. Fakes inside, comes out on the option, pitches to Brooks. He's headed to backfield to 50, gets away, flag on the play, across the 40, down to the 36-yard line is James Brooks. There's a penalty marker down in the Auburn backfield, and let's check that penalty. I think we got a crack back clip, Paul. Uh, Paul. A lot of animation on the Georgia sideline, the near sideline, and so it appears the uh, walk-off will go against Auburn. Joke, uh, James Brooks got that pitch all the way back at the 50-yard line, seven yards behind the line of scrimmage, ran down to the 35, but it's all going to come back. And Charlie Trotman signals that it is a crackback penalty against Auburn. Quickly, this broadcast is authorized under broadcasting rights granted by Auburn University solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. Any publication, rebroadcast, or other use of the descriptions and accounts of this game without the express written consent of WAUD Radio in Auburn and Auburn University is prohibited. The announcers for this broadcast are employed by WAUD Radio, selected with the approval of Auburn University. Penalty moves the ball back to the 43-yard line of Auburn. It'll now be first down, 24 to go for the Auburn Tigers. Double wide out to right, split backs behind Trotman and a wide out left. No tight end in the game for the Auburn Tigers. They're spreading it out. They give inside to Cribs. He finds a little running room. That's Brooks, I'm sorry, and he's up to the 45, and that's all. Maybe the 46-yard line hit by a host of Georgia Bulldogs. Frank Ross, the linebacker, I think, got there first along with Terry, the end. Play gained up to the 46-yard line. And so it'll be second down now, 22, for the Auburn Tigers. Passing situation now. And, uh... Auburn's got to put it up in the air to make up the uh, 15 yards that they were penalized for. Again, double wide outs right. Franklin wide by himself to the left side. On second down, 22. Trotman is back to throw, rolling to his right. He's got a lot of time. He's got a lot of room. He is away. It is tipped incomplete. He was looking for Byron Franklin, but the linebacker, Nate Taylor, came over and knocked the ball down. The Tifton termite, Nate Taylor, a walk-on, came over and knocked the ball down as Franklin was running free at the 40-yard line of Georgia. Boy, Paul, there's a lot of conversation going on down there between those players. you got a lot of Georgia boys playing with Auburn, and, of course, uh, they remember each other from high school days and this being a big rivalry and uh, and everything that's riding on it. It's going to be <laughs> it's going to be tough down on the grass down there today. Atkins and Robbins wide right. Franklin wide left on third down 22 at the Auburn 46-yard line. Long count for Trotman. He gives to Brooks inside. Brooks at the 50 and knocked down as he got into Georgia territory at the 48-yard line. Again, Nate Taylor, the linebacker, came over and made the play. And that tackle by the shoestring kept Brooks from going a long way. Auburn again will have to punt, but this time it's from the Georgia 48-yard line. Skip Johnston is in to punt. Deep is Scott Werner for the Georgia Bulldogs. This would be a great time for Skip to hit one of those little uh, semi punts that he tries to hold down so that the uh, coverage can get down and stop it inside the 10. Georgia with six men up on the line, and they are not going to rush. Skip kicks to the far side of the field, gets a beautiful spiral away. It is going to land at the 15 and go down near the sideline and be down at the two-yard line. That oh ball boy. hit at the 12-yard line and hugged the sideline all the way down to the two-yard line. And Auburn had a host of people down there to down it. I think Rusty Bird got it. A 46-yard punt for Skip Johnston. Georgia starts at a hole at the two-yard line. That ball had Auburn eyes, Mike Cohen. It really did. You called it, Phil Snow. And uh, Skip Johnston really has a knack of being able to do that and has been very successful with it this year. They're right in front of the Auburn cheering section and the Auburn band on the far side. Everybody up. And now Lindsey Scott comes out of the game. He will not be in the lineup. Carmen Prince in the lineup. Georgia in the power eye at their two-yard line. No score in the game. Early first quarter action. Georgia with the ball for their first possession. Buck Ballou, the quarterback. He fakes inside, gives it. Oh. He's hit in the end zone. It's a safety. He's hit in the end zone by Frank Warren and knocked down. Ballou is down on the ground. He may be injured. Frank Warren knocked him down for a safety. There's timeout on the field with the score. Auburn two, Georgia nothing. took any kind of fake he looked as though he looked knew Baloo had the ball the whole time well it was obvious the Auburn defense the defenders feel uh, had the middle covered and uh, it was uh, Frank's responsibility to, to cover the option or the rollout of the quarterback and he did a good job doing it okay following the safety the free kick will be handled by punter Mike Garrett Joe Cribbs is deep for Auburn at the Auburn 30 yard line Garrett of course will punt from the Georgia 20 Auburn leading 2-0, 10 to go here in the first quarter of play, and Buck Ballou has just left the field with a knee injury after Frank Warren tackled him in the end zone. 
Garrett's kicks a high spiral. Cripps takes it at the 28-yard line, across the 30, 35. He's at the 40, surging forward up to near the 45-yard line, and Auburn will start with very good field position, and things are suddenly very quiet here in Sanford Stadium. Uh, where these host of Georgia fans were looking for the Sugar Dogs today. That is a tremendous bl uh, blow to lose Buck Ballou if, in fact, he cannot return to the game. But in the case of Georgia, they have a pretty good quarterback on the bench. They have the guy who took him to a great year last year in Jeff Pyburn. He is an experienced quarterback. He started the year playing quarterback, but has been uh, moved out of his position by Ballou in the last three or four weeks. Chester Willis is in. James Brooks is out. Auburn with double wideouts left. Bird and Robbins, Franklin wide right on first down at the 45-yard line. Trotman gives to Cripps. Cripps at the 45, surges forward to the 48-yard line, and that's all. Gain of three. Let's see where they mark him down. Maybe a gain of four as the whole pile of players just tried to surge forward there. They did gain three. It'll be second down, seven for Auburn. Pat McShay made the tackle for the Georgia Bulldogs. The dogs appear to be pursuing very well on the wide stuff, Mike. Do you think Auburn may turn inside now and try to hurt them inside? Well, it's obvious they're plugging up the whole drill effectively on the inside, too, Phil. Burr, or rather, Brooks is back in. Bird and Robbins wide left, Franklin wide right. Split backs for Trotman on second down seven. He comes out on the counter option. Tries to get his pitch away again. Now keeps the 50. He's at the 45 and down at the 42-yard line is Charlie Trotman. Trotman kept it inside, running in heavy traffic all the way and got first down yardage to the Georgia 42-yard line. Finally knocking him down was Randy Cook, the defensive end. It's a first down Auburn at the Georgia 42-yard line. 11-yard run for old Charles there. He's two for 21 uh, yards so far. Ryan Atkins, wide right. Robbins wide right in the slot. Franklin wide left. High backfield for Charlie Trotman. First down at the Georgia 42. Now Cribs and Brooks will split the backfield. Trotman back to throw. He's trying to throw a screen. That's a lateral, and it went out of bounds way back there at the Auburn or at the Georgia 49-yard line. Trotman tried to hit a long lateral to Mark Robbins, and the ball went behind Mark Robbins and went out of bounds. Obviously a breakdown in the play. Charlie definitely appeared to be throwing the quick screen out there, and Mark Robbins took let's, two steps downfield. Let's check the uh, ruling here. They first ruled the lateral. They marked it at the 49, and now they've moved it back up, but they're going to move it back down to the 49-yard line. I think it was quite obvious that that was a lateral, and so Auburn will take a seven-yard loss. Second down, 17 now for the Auburn Tigers. Had Charlie got the ball to Robbins, it looked as though the play was forming real well. Had some offensive linemen out there, and Robbins had some running room. That'll go as, I guess, a running play, loss of seven. Atkins and Robbins move wide left. Franklin wide right on second down, 17 at the 49. Cribs and Brooks split behind Trotman. He fakes inside, gives to Cribs at the 45, 40. He's at the 35, 30, 25, 20, and knocked down at the 20-yard line on a shoestring tackle. Pat Collins, I think, came up to knock him down. Pat Collins, a rover, just got Joe Cribs on a shoestring tackle. He just exploded for 30 yards down to the 20-yard line. You know, Paul, we've been wondering about the breakaway speed of Joe Cribs the last few weeks. He looked as though he hasn't had that. He's got it. He's got it. No question about it. And, Bill, that's been a concern of uh, some Georgia people with Georgia stacking up eight people on the line of scrimmage to get Cribs or Brooks in that backfield, and they could go for some valuable yardage, and he just did that. Auburn first down at the Georgia 20. Double wide outs left. That's Bird and Robbins. Frank and wide right. Gribbs and Brooks again behind Charlie Trotman on first down at the 20. They come out on the counter option. Trotman keeps his hit and knocked down right at the line of scrimmage. Trotman slipped as he tried to make his cut and sort of stumbled. That allowed pursuit to catch him from behind on the counter option. Play failed again. Second down 10, Eddie Weaver, the middle guard or one of the left guards uh, on that defensive set, came in to knock him down. It looked as though George had heard the offensive call in the huddle because they had about five guys uh, shifted to the strong side that uh, Charlie was optioning to. Brian Atkins brings the play in, goes wide right. Robbins in the slot right. Franklin wide left on second down 10 at the 20-yard line of Georgia. Trotman with Auburn up. Long count for Charlie Trotman. Movement in the line. Flags are down. Trotman rolling the pass. He's pursued back there. Gets his pass away incomplete at the 8-yard line. Georgia had a couple of people offsides. We'll have to see if Auburn drew them off or not. 8.06 to go first quarter. Clock is stopped. Auburn leads 2 to nothing. Sure would be a big break for Auburn if they get that uh, five yards. That will uh, give them a uh, second down in good position. And it will be a five-yard walk-off against the Georgia Bulldogs. Trotman burying the count and had a couple of Georgia men jumping offside. So now Auburn will face a second down five at the 15-yard line of the Georgia Bulldogs. Last week, these dogs played Florida. Florida helped them greatly in the first half by turning the ball over and giving them field position the first half. So far, Georgia's been their own worst enemy. 
Now Coach Alex Gibbs with some substitution in the line. Buck Ballou is being uh, helped from the playing field. He is not walking. Auburn up on second down five at the 15-yard line of Georgia. Double wide outs left. Franklin, or rather Robbins and Berg. Franklin wide right. Trotman rolls right, looking to throw. Has time. Gets his pass away. It is dropped on the eight-yard line by Byron Franklin. Franklin was open. Trotman threw it behind him. Scott Werner was a defensive uh, player in the vicinity over there, and the pass simply didn't get there. Third down five now for Auburn at the 15-yard line of Georgia. Georgia's had the ball only one offensive play. 7.54 to go here first quarter. Auburn with the ball, third down five at the Georgia 15. That one offensive play, Frank Warren tackled Buck Ballou in the end zone for a safety. Auburn leads 2-0. It's obvious that uh, Auburn's trying to keep the Georgia defense honest because they threw in second and five, and they hadn't done that uh, very often this year. Atkins and Robbins wide left, Franklin wide right, split backs. They move right, give to Cribs. Cribs is down to the 11, maybe the 10-yard line, and we'll have to see where they mark him down if he got the first down. First down marker is just short of the 10-yard line. Cribs is down just short of the 10-yard line. I don't think it's going to be a first down. I think they're going to have to decide what they're going to do. They signal it is fourth down. Fourth and less than a yard, and Auburn takes a timeout. Timeout on the field with the score. The Auburn Tigers to the Georgia Bulldogs. Nothing. Down zone, uh, and I think it's a good decision, Phil, don't you, at the first yeah. part of the game with the momentum uh, I do. in Auburn's direction with uh, just about uh, half a foot uh, left to go for a first down. Right, and they've also had the timeout, so they could put in some kind of play. If, if Georgia comes up on them, they might throw that thing in there for a touchdown. Well, they put in two tight ends, Keith Euchre and Mike Locklear, power eye on fourth and one. Georgia with everybody in there, and somebody jumped offside. Let's see who it is. Georgia jumped offside in the Auburn backfield, but Auburn, let's see if Auburn drew them off. Nope, Georgia offsides. Auburn gets the easy first down. Well, that's a sure way to make it, isn't it? Auburn gets it the easy way as the Georgia man jumped offsides. On Trotman's signal, Auburn has it first and goal at the five-yard line. Is it possible to get too excited for a football game? Auburn, uh, Georgia's been jumping around and, and making mistakes. That's very possible. Joe Cremans, a man who just came into the game as they added me to the line, jumped offsides. Auburn up still in the power eye. First and goal at the five-yard line. Long count for Charlie Trotman. Everybody up close. They give to the deep man Cribs. He's over the line. Jumps down to the one-yard line. Inside the one-yard line before being knocked down oh, is Joe Cribs. What a tremendous run. <laughs> Everything was stacked up, and Joe went all the way over the top down to the one-yard line. Dale Williams, Frank Ross knocked him down. They are at the one-foot line. Second down goal, Auburn at the one. You know, the amazing thing, Phil, was that he was able to keep his feet after jumping right. uh, about uh, two yards up in the air to get that extra couple of yards. He may have been wor working with James Walker, the hurdler. Auburn up, second down goal at the one-yard line. Dropping the quarterback. Everybody stacked in close. They give to Cribs. He's into the end zone. Touchdown! Cribs off left tackle. Got into the end zone. Touchdown! James Brooks and Ed DuBose were the blockers on that left end. And they got him in along with Brad Everett. It looks as though Auburn came to win this ball game. back down there is set to kick off he gets a signal from the official or at least now he gets a signal from the official George Portella approaches the football and the second half is underway kick is high and short with the win Scott is going to take it on the run at the 10 15 20 across the 25 30 fumble who got the ball Scott fumbled the ball let's see who got it it popped out of there very quickly, and let's see who came up with the football. Clifford Auburn, Tony thinks uh, Auburn got it. Auburn says they did. There's Dan Dickerson coming out. Clock is stopped. Portella signals Auburn has it. No signal from the official yet. Big stack up down at the 30-yard line. Let's see who has the football. They're still trying to unpack them in there. Gee whiz, nobody wants to get up. And now let's see. They signal Georgia has the ball. I wonder what happened down in that pile. Chris Martin and Adolph Cosby and Johnny Cheeks were all down in there for Auburn, but Georgia came out with it. They'll have it first down at their 32-yard line, so that's where the Bulldogs start with the second-half kickoff. Lindsey Scott returns 22 yards to the 32-yard line. Georgia with the ball, and they dodged a bullet that time on a fumble. Fiber to quarterback. He sends Lindsey Scott wide left. Everybody else in tight. High backfield behind him, and now Amp Arnold goes in motion. 
to the right side. Right side is wide. Pyburn rolls that way. Pressure's on. Gets his pass away complete at the 35. He breaks away at the 40, and across the 40 up to the 41 or 42-yard line is Amp Arnold. Arnold, the man in motion, caught the ball and broke a couple of tackles. Got all the way across the 40-yard line up near the 42-yard line. Play game nine. It's second down one for Georgia, and actually it's, very, it's less than one yard to go. Jeff Byburn's having a great day throwing the football. He has nine completions, ten attempts for 96 yards. Lindsey Scott is wide left. Again, they have the man in the slot, Carmen Prince this time. They give to the fullback, Womack. He has the first down, I think, up across the 42-yard line. In there to get him quickly was Edmund Nelson, but not before he did get first down yardage. So first down, Georgia, as they move across the 42-yard line up to the 43. They mark it across the 42, first and 10 for the Georgia Bulldogs. It's interesting to note that uh, Georgia did come out throwing the ball the first time. Uh, they obviously looked at the halftime stats just like we did. <laughs> Lindsey Scott moves wide left again. Carmen Prince in the slot on the left side. Left is the wide side of the field. Bob Harris is out with Lindsey Scott. Byburn up in the eye. Quick pitch to the deep back, Simon. Simon at the 40. He's at the 45 and knocked down at the 46-yard line. Freddie Smith got a hand on him to knock him down. Play gains up to the 47-yard line. Play gained five yards, or call it a gain of four. Second down, six at the 47-yard line. The Georgia Dogs would like nothing better than to come out here on the first drive of the second half and put it in the end zone. 13-15 to go third quarter. Georgia leads Auburn 10-9. Carmen Prince wide right. Lindsey Scott wide left. Pyburn has him up. Eye backfield. He is back to throw. Straight back. Has time. Has a lot of time. Now pressure's on. Gets his pass away. Tipped incomplete. Had a man wide open. Norris Brown had to go through his hands and up in the air incomplete. As Brown came open at the Auburn 45-yard line. That'll bring up now third down seven. Third down six, actually, at the 47-yard line of Georgia. That may have been, been just thrown too hard ball. He really nailed him with that ball, and he was only about 10 yards from him. I, I think it was the question of him throwing the ball too hard there. Georgia four of seven on third down conversions in the first half. They're up on third and six now. And they send Scott and Prince wide right. Norris wide left. Fiburn back to throw. Has time. Now pressure's on. Gets his pass away deep. He's got a man out there. It is complete the 35 and knocked down inside the 35-yard line at the Auburn 33-yard line. Darrell Wilkes made the tackle, but Lindsey Scott got open and went high in the air and got the football. That's a Georgia first down at the Auburn 33-yard line. Those third down conversions again. They are making them. That's a difficult uh, pattern to cover with the two receivers to that side. And uh, Scott, the uh, receiver, came to the inside like a post pattern and then cut it outside and uh, was in that open area and came up with a good reception. Scott is wide right with Darrell Wilkes. Carmen Prince wide left. Bob Harris on him. Iburn up on first down. They pitch to Simon. He cuts it inside at the 35. Hit and knocked down at the 33-yard line. Coming across to get him was Freddie Smith. Chris Martin was there to help out, and the play failed again. Second down, 10 for Georgia at the 33-yard line. James McKinney also play, coming up yeah. from the uh, safety position, making a very aggressive tackle. It was 13 instead of 31 that time. Right. James played hard in the last couple of games. He's made some big plays. Now let's see. Amp Arnold checks in. Carmen Prince is the tailback. They have four wide receivers in there. Prince is going to line up at the tailback position. And now they, they split the backs behind Pyburn. He's straight back to throw. Looking downfield. He is away deep. He's got a man out there. It's intercepted at the eight-yard line. Intercepted by Bob Harris and down at the Auburn eight-yard line. They were looking for Amp Arnold down the middle. And Bob Harris was just playing center field and went up and got the ball at the eight-yard line of Auburn. That's the same pattern that Georgia has ran several times today with Prince the back going on the air a pattern toward the sideline and the two receivers Scott and Arnold heading down the field and uh, just a bad throw on the part of uh, Piper the quarterback and a good play on the part of Bob Harris the uh, cornerback. Piper just thought he would be open and just put it right. up there. Georgia leads Auburn 10 to 9 11 53 to go here in the third quarter Auburn with the ball for the first time they'll start at their eight yard line. Cribs and Brooks behind Charlie Trotman Bird. And Robbins wide left, Franklin is wide right. Now they split Cribs and Brooks behind Troppen. They fake it inside. They give it inside to Brooks, and Brooks is up near the 13 or 14 yard line before being knocked down inside. Pat McShay, the right end, got him down. And now some words being exchanged down there between some of the players. Quick opener gained 
about six yards. Call it a second down four. The ball near the 14-yard line. Good uh, first down run there. And Auburn needs to get it out of here deep in their own territory. Now Franklin and Brooks leave the game. Ed Dubose and Cribs are the deep backs behind. Charlie Troppen on second down. They give to Joe Cribs. Cribs at the 15 and knocked down at the 16-yard line. They gained about two to the 16. It'll be third down. Third down along to Eddie Weaver made the tackle for the Georgia Bulldogs. This is a big play. Auburn needs this first down. Give them some running room out to about the 25. Byron Franklin now checks back in, and Locklear, the tight end, will go out. So Auburn used the tight end for just one play. 10.58 to go third quarter. Georgia leads 10 to 9. Auburn up third down along two at the 16-yard line. DuBose and Cripps behind Charlie Troutman. Double wide outs right, Franklin wide left. Now they split DuBose and Cripps behind Charlie Troutman. Long count. He's back to throw. He's looking. He's got a man. It's complete at the 20. And knocked down at the 21-yard line is Byron Franklin. That's an Auburn first down. Scott Warner defending. But Byron Franklin was open and caught it. Jeff Hip and Scott Warner knocked him down quickly. It's an Auburn first down at the 21-yard line. And Byron Franklin was looking directly into the sun when that ball arrived. That's a good call on the part of Auburn's offense, too. They had eight guys stacked up on that line of scrimmage uh, ready for that uh, up-the-middle play, and Charlie had a good call. That shows you something about the confidence that Charlie Trotman and his, uh, his coaches have in him. He hasn't completed one all day. They go for it on third down and two. Cribs is out. Brooks is in a tailback. He gets a carry up the middle, 25. Brooks up to the 28-yard line before being knocked down. Had a little spin at the 25 and dove forward for three more yards before being knocked down by Pat Collins, the rover. So James Brooks up very quickly. Frank Ross also went on the tackle. And Brooks got it across the 25 very quickly up to the 28-yard line. They just surged forward with power running that time. I was talking to a pro scout at halftime, uh, Paul, and uh, he noted that uh, he'd never seen such acceleration on the part of the running backs as he's seen in uh, James Brooks today. They got seven. Now Cribs and Brooks are back in the backfield on second down three. Trotman moves right, gives it to Cribs. Cribs is up to the 30-yard line, maybe the 31-yard line before being knocked down. He'll be very close but short of first down yardage. So give him a gain of two. It'll be third down one. The ball across the 30-yard line. They've got across the 31-yard line. Nate Taylor and Tim Parks made the tackle for Georgia. Another big third down play, although this is third and one, and uh, you would think that Auburn, the rushing team, ought to be able to get a yard and get this first down. Bird wide left, Robbins wide right. They check the tight end lock there back in. Willis is in instead of Cribs. Brooks, the deep man in the eye. Georgia showing blitz. They give to Cribs anyway. He is short, maybe, of the first down. Hit and knocked down as they got to the line of scrimmage, and we'll have to see where they mark it down. I don't think he made it. Eddie Weaver, the defensive guard, got in and knocked him down. Play failed again. It's fourth down. That was just great penetration on the part of the Georgia defense and enabled Weaver to slip onto that uh, offensive line and come up with the uh, shoes of uh, Brooks, the running back. They failed to gain fourth and one. Skip Johnston will await the snap at the 15-yard line. Scott Werner is deep for Georgia at their 30. Wind is behind Skip Johnston. Low snap. He takes it off the ground. Gets his kick away. A high spiral. Werner signals fair catch and makes it at the 19-yard line. Tremendous kick by Skip Johnston. He got it high up in the wind, and the spiral turned over very well. That's a 50-yard kick for Skip Johnston. Skip. Go ahead, Captain. Skip having one of his finest days, uh, Phil. He averaged 47, over 47 yards the first half, and that one, the first one in the second half, over 50 yards. Great he's day. spiraling them today. Yes, sir. When he's spiraling them, he's kicking them 50 yards. When he's kicking them end over end, they're at least going 38 and 40. So. 8.21 to go third quarter. Georgia leads 10 to 9. The Bulldogs have the ball again. At their 19, they send Amp Arnold wide left, double wide outs to the right side. No tight end for Georgia now. Fiburn is up in the eye. Straight back. Gives on the draw to Simon. Simon's at the 20. He's at the 25. Fumble! It's caught by Bob Harris. Auburn has the ball at the 30-yard line. He fumbled it straight up in the air, and Bob Harris caught it in the air. The second interception of the second half by Bob Harris. Auburn has it at the 30-yard line of Georgia. Things coming alive now as Simon found running room on the draw play, ran up for about 10 yards, but somebody really stuck him right at the 28-yard line, and the ball popped high in the air. Bob Harris was waiting for it. Auburn has it first down at the 30-yard line. Big break on the part of Auburn. Sure is. Two turnovers early in the second half of play against the Georgia Dogs. Auburn hasn't gotten anything out of the first one. It remains to be seen what they can do here. Trotman changing his play at the line. He has double wideouts. Atkins and Robbins right. Fumble, and Georgia has it back. Trotman dropped the snap from center. 
He just dropped the snap from center, and Georgia has it back. Recovered by Ken McCraney. He made the big play earlier and threw Troutman for a loss in the second quarter when Auburn was moving. And then he just made the big play recovering that snap from center. And so Georgia has it back at their 31-yard line. Just not a good exchange between the center and Charlie. Right. you got two seniors there handling the ball, and those things just happen. So Georgia has it back at their 31-yard line. They send F. Arnold wide left. Lindsey Scott wide right. High backfield for Jeff Pyburn. Hyburn rolls to his right. He's looking to throw. Has a lot of time back there. Gets his pass away. I think it's out of bounds, and it is. Incomplete out of bounds. Had Lindsey Scott on the sideline in front of the Auburn bench, but Scott tried to keep his feet in bounds and couldn't as he dove out of bounds to make that catch. Second down, 10 at the 31-yard line for Georgia. Jeff Hyburn is a very strong-armed quarterback. He, he was rolling to his right, and he still hummed that ball, I mean, on a dead line. Now Carney Norris checks out. Let's see if Simon went back in or Carmen Prince. Prince will be the deep back in the eye. Actually, they're not going to be in the eye. They split the backs. Double wide outs right, single wide out left on second down 10. Pyburn straight back to throw. Pressure's on. He is away, complete, and knocked down hard on the far sideline, right at the 32-yard line. Let's see who came over to make that play. Clifford Tony. Clifford Tony. Carmen Prince was the receiver coming out of the backfield. Clifford Tony stayed with him that time and made the play. And the play gained only a yard to the 32-yard line. Third down nine for Georgia now at the 32-yard line. And Frank Warren arrived just after he threw that ball and really made Jeff pay for, for that one. Now Prince has to leave the game. Tony wasn't going to let that uh, happen twice because that's the one that Prince was open with, uh, open on about uh, for the 10-yard uh, play in the first half. Scott wide right, Arnold wide left. Pyburn gives him the delay to Norris. He is hit, gets away for a moment, but then is knocked down as he got up to the 33 or 34 yard line. That's all. Ken Hardy knocked him down. Play gained one to the 33 and Georgia sends Mike Garrett on for his first punt of the day on fourth down eight. Joe Cribs is deep for Auburn. Kind of strange that uh, as well as Jeff's been throwing the ball, they suddenly run on third and eight. I guess they're trying to cross him up. Garrett stands at the 18. High snap, but he gets it and gets his kick away against the wind. It's a lazy spiral. Cribs is going to field it. He is hit and knocked down immediately at the 34-yard line. Joe Cribs fielded the ball and was hit and knocked down very quickly as he fielded it at the 34-yard line. That's a 34-yard punt for Mike Garrett, and so Auburn will start at first and 10 at that point. Gee, I, I would think Joe should have made a fair catch on that, but uh, he, was, he was ready to catch it and move with it. Twin turnovers cost Auburn a golden opportunity on their last possession. And so now, Troutman has him up. Double wide outs left side, Bird and Robbins. He has Franklin wide right. Cribs and Brooks in the eye. They're out rolling left. Troutman looking to throw. It's caught and dropped. Hit Rusty Bird right in the numbers, and he just popped off his shoulder pads and, and fell to the turf. Charlie drilled it right in there. And again, it might be a case of throwing a little hard, Phil. He yep. drilled him. It seemed to me, though, that uh, he just took his eye off it just as it arrived, looking for the defender. That was definitely a, a good throw on the part of Trotman and uh, a reception that should have been had on the part of Bird. Second down, 10, Auburn up at the 34-yard line. Bird and Robbins wide left. Franklin wide right. Chester Willis is in, replacing Cribs at the fullback spot. They fake it inside. Trotman keeps on the option. He pitches to Brooks at the 35-40. 45-50. Brooks at the 45-40. He's at the 35. He may go all the way. 25, 20, 50, 10, 5. Touchdown. What a run oh. by James Brooks. Oh, he cut it down to short side option and cut it all the way back across the field and took it in for the touchdown. 66 yards for James Brooks. And everybody on the field had at least one shot at him that That's time. That's right. That's something Auburn has that nobody else has in the SEC today, and that's a guy like Brooks and Cribs. It is a great Break advantage. Back. Oh, my goodness, what an advantage it is to have those two guys in the same backfield. And don't forget Charlie Trotman strung that option out all yes, the sir. way to the sideline before he pitched. Great ball handling on the part of Trotman. Auburn wants to go for two. They can't get anybody in, and I think they may have to take a timeout. Well, let's see what's going to happen. They want the ball moved over to the hash mark. Charlie's buying a little time. He's asking that the ball be moved and, and trying to get the play in. They don't have but 10 men on the field, and now Auburn may have to use a timeout here. They can't get the 10th man or the 11th man in, and now here comes somebody. The coaches in the booth to our left want Auburn to call timeout, but they just now marked it in place, so they have 25 seconds now to get this play called. This is a very important two points because that will give Auburn a seven-point lead if they can make the two-point conversion. 
Yeah. Robin has him up. Clock is running. They're in the power eye. He's been running a long time. They send Brooks in motion right out of the power eye. Willis is the up back. Pitch to Cribs. He wants to throw and can't. He's knocked down. There is a flag on the play. There is a flag on the play. Let's check that penalty. Let's check the penalty. Georgia blitzed everybody that time as Cribs wanted to throw the option pass. However, Auburn players are leaving the field, and so let's check. It appears it might be against Auburn. Illegal motion is the penalty against Tigers 15, the Georgia Bulldogs 10. Start first and 10 at their 20 yard line. You say you never see the short side option work for big yardage. Well, James Brooks just took one 66 yards, Mike. He certainly did, did a great job. I've often wondered why they run to the short side of the field. Now I know. That's right. Gives him more room to cut back against the grain, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Incidentally, James Brooks went over the 1,000 uh, yard mark for the year early in this ball game. Joe Cribbs was about 140 short of the 1,000 yards. He's got, by I reckoning, over 100 now, so it's conceivable that both these young guys could cross the 1,000 yard mark in yardage here on the turf of Sanford Stadium today. Georgia up first and 10. Piper the quarterback. Double wide outs right. He gives to the tailback Norris. Norris at the 20. He's at the 25. Hit. Gets away. Fumble. And Auburn has the ball. Auburn has the ball. It's Bob Harris again. Bob Harris with his third turnover in the third quarter has the football at the 27-yard line. They'll mark him down at the 28. Bob Harris got the ball again. I couldn't see who made the big hit. I think they just stripped it away from him. He spun around trying to get more yardage, and the ball just stripped away. You got the freshman running back in there. He has great talent, but he has difficulty holding on to the ball. Auburn up first down at the Georgia 28-yard line. Dropped by the quarterback. Sends Franklin wide right. Robbins and Bird wide left. Cribs and Peoples behind Charlie Trotman. Movement in the line. They give to Cribs. He dives forward across the 25 up to the 24-yard line before being knocked down. I hope I didn't see a flag go in that pile. Nate Taylor made the tackle. Play gained. No huddle. Play Welcome gained back. four. Second down six. Auburn going without a huddle. They're trying to put the kill in here. Trotman has him up. Split backs, Peoples and Cribs behind him. Again, Franklin wide right. They give inside to Cribs again. He's at the 20. Cribs down at the 18 or 17 yard line. Somebody grabbed him by a shoestring. It looked like a man inside the line of scrimmage, uh, number 93, and I don't see him here. Nate Taylor reached up off the ground and knocked him down. That's an Auburn first down. They'll mark it down at the 17 yard line. And now they have to stop play for a moment to mark the ball. They do mark it. It's first down Auburn at the 17. Auburn going without a huddle. Trotman has him up. He wants to run a counter option to the left side. He turns it up inside 15 and down to the 11-yard line is Charlie Trotman. Great quarterback. And now there's a flag on the play in the vicinity of Rusty Bird and Scott Warner. And let's see what happened out there. Flag on the play. Rusty Bird and Scott Warner were engaging in something in the deep secondary. Auburn is cheering. I think it's against the defensive back. Well, let's check and see. Going to be a personal foul against Auburn, a personal foul against Georgia. Offsetting penalties. Oh, well. That's second best anyway. Well. I think it was a dead ball foul also. Should not affect the uh, the down on the yardage. Should it? Rotman carried from the 18 down to, and let's see where they're going to mark him down. Auburn's going without a huddle, but they have not marked the ball down. They're going to mark it down at the 12. And now let's see what happens. Georgia is going to take a timeout. So the Bulldogs, perhaps unnerved by Auburn going without a huddle, takes a timeout. Timeout on the field with a score. Auburn 15, the Georgia Bulldogs 10. Stadium, this is Paul Allen with Mike Cullen and Phil Snow. The Auburn Tigers lead the Georgia Bulldogs 15 to 10. 5.37 to go here in the third quarter. Auburn with the ball. And the Tigers face it second down five at the Georgia 12-yard line. They have forced three Georgia turnovers here in the third period, and Bob Harris, the sophomore from Decatur, Georgia, has come up with all three of them. They uh, now mark the ball in play, and so Auburn up second down, five at the 12-yard line. Power eye backfield, DuBose, Brooks, and Cribs behind Charlie Trotman with two tight ends. They give it inside to Cribs. He's at the 10. He surges forward to the 9 and maybe the 8. We'll see where they mark him down. He is at the 9-yard line, and that's going to bring up a third down 2 at the 9-yard line of the Georgia Bulldogs. Clock is running. 5.20 to go. Taylor and Ross made the tackle. Georgia beefing up, uh, beefing up their uh, up defensive front now with a couple of big guys. They're up again in the power eye. Brooks and DuBose in front of Cribs on third and 2. Rodman sets his offense, double tight end set. 
Everybody in close. Fakes inside, gives inside to Cribs. He is very close to first down yardage. Trotman says they have it. The officials say it'll be close, and let's see. It depends on where they mark his knee down. The ball is in the vicinity of the seven-yard line, and they're going to bring the chains in to measure. Pat McShea made the tackle on he's, Joe Cribs. He's, he's got, got it. it. He's got <laughs> it. You're right. You checked it out, didn't you, Mr. Snow? Yeah, he's got it. They stretch the chains. It is first and goal Auburn inside the seven-yard line of Georgia. Auburn up with four cracks now. The ball at the six-yard line. We'll see the power eye here with the two tight ends, I would imagine, and we'll see Auburn come right at him, try to grind it out inside for that touchdown, a big touchdown. DuBose and Brooks in front of Joe Cribs in the power eye. They're set to the uh, short side of the field this time. That's the left side. Auburn moving left to right. Trotman moves out, gives to Cribs. He is at the five, maybe the four, before being knocked back. I think they'll mark him down right near the five-yard line. That's a gain of one. Second down goal at the five-yard line. Joe Cribs just trying to follow the power blocking, Mike, on the left side that time. We've seen Auburn go right behind Claude Matthews many times this year when they really needed that yardage. They ran that power eye that time left-handed to the left side. They usually line up to the right side. They Mark Robbins is the second tight end now instead of Keith Euchre. He is set to the right. Double tight end set, power eye backfield on second down goal to five. Give to Cribs. He's at the three. He's at the two. He's at the one-yard line before being knocked down. Gee, what a run. He got that last two yards on his own. It'll be third and goal now. Auburn at the Georgia one-yard line. A big, big play here. 3.50 to go in the third quarter. Auburn leads 15 to 10. Tigers trying to capitalize on another Georgia turnover. Ball at the one-yard line. DuBose, Brooks in front of Cribs. On third and goal at the one. Long cap by Charlie Trotman. Double tight end set. They give to Cribs. He dives. Touchdown! Touchdown, Joe Cribs. Right over the left guard position that time. And Joe Cribs scores yet another touchdown. What's that, 14, Phil? 14 for Joe Cribs this year. He's adding to his uh, lead in the conference as the scoring leader. Now let's see what Auburn elects to do. They went for two last time. It appears the Tigers will go for two once again. Now they try to keep enough players in there this time. Keith Euchre tried to leave the game. Now he signaled back in. You got to give credit to that offensive line on that uh, those last three plays. First and uh, goal to goal in the seven. They did an outstanding job. Auburn up on the two-point attempt. Power eye with two tight ends. They move right. Trotman wants to throw. He has his pass away. It is complete. Mark Robbins complete for the two-point conversion. Trotman found him in the right corner of the end zone. Timeout on the field with the score. The Auburn Tigers 23, the Georgia Bulldogs 10. quarter of this game was mostly Auburn. The second quarter, all Georgia. The third quarter has been all Auburn. Georgia's turned the ball over three times, and Auburn has come from behind to take a 23-10 lead. George Portella set to kick off. Lindsey Scott is deep for the Georgia Bulldogs. Portella approaches the ball and gets his kick. It is a high end over end kick. Scott's going to take it. He may run it out from eight yards out. deep across the goal. Five, 10, 15, 20, and knocked down at the 19. There's a flag on the play. Let's see what it is. It may be a clip. It may be a clip. Man who got a handout was Dan Dickerson, I think, who got a handout and tripped him up, and they, he may have been clipped as he made the tackle, so let's check the penalty. Auburn obviously thinks so. They're shouting and kicking and jumping, going off the field. I don't think There's it was another flag back up field in the middle of the field at the 38-yard line, Mike. I don't think the clip was intentional. It was uh, called on James Brown, the big tight end from J.D. in Montgomery, Alabama, but uh, didn't look intentional at all. Scott was marked down at the night team. You know, Mike, we always talk about these Georgia boys getting uh, on the field with one another, uh, but there's a lot of Alabama guys on the uh, opposite sides it. of the ball down there, too, so that just adds to the fervor, I would think. Yes, sir. Penalty moves the ball back to the nine-yard line. Georgia will start first and 10 at their nine-yard line. 3.24 to go here, third quarter. Auburn leads 23 to 10. Amp Arnold, would wide right. Go ahead, Phil. Be asking too much to get one more turnover down here? 
Byburn has him up with Lindsey Scott wide left. High backfield as the shadows creep across the field. They pitch to Simon. Simon at the five. He is hit. Gets across the 10, though, and up near the 15-yard line. Good running by Matt Simon. Zach Hardy had a hand on him in the backfield. Could not hang on, and Simon gets about five yards. Maybe six yards up to the 15, second down four at the Georgia 15-yard line. He made a good run out of what looked like sure. at least no gain. Second down four, Georgia at their 15. Clock running three minutes now to go in the third quarter. Arnold is wide left, Lindsey Scott wide right. Warming up with a lot of people near the line of scrimmage now. Hyburn gives to the deep man Simon. He breaks a tackle at the 15, but James McKinney comes up and knocks him down at the 16-yard line. Harris Rayburn messed up that play. He uh, blitzed. Apparently, he had some kind of key, and uh, he knew it was going to the tailback, and he got in the backfield and messed things up. They gained one. Now it's third down. Third and a long three at the 16. They have to cross the 19-yard line. That's just a lead play on the part of the Georgia offense where Rayburn has to meet the uh, fullback uh, at the line of scrimmage or perhaps in their backfield and disrupt things and did a good job that time. They send Scott and Arnold both very wide left. Norris Brown is wide right. Hyburn has him up. Byron wants to throw. Pressure's on. He gets away at the goal line. Now he's scrambling at the five. Gets his pass away. It is tipped incomplete at the 20-yard line. Let's see. Jimmy Womack was the intended receiver. Harris Rayburn uh, broke it up. Marvin Zach Williams was a man back there deep running around the goal line with Pyburn, though. That's right. It'll bring up a fourth down play. Fourth down, a long three. And Mike Garrett will stand at the goal line, ready to punt the ball. Joe Cribbs is on standing near midfield. Good coverage, though, on the part of Harris Raven, the linebacker, over on the sideline. Garrett gets a snap. It's a good one. Pressure's on. Almost blocked. They get it away, and the punter goes down, but he was not hit. Ball lands near midfield, bounces sideways, and will go out of bounds in Auburn territory at about the 47-yard line. So he Auburn tried, will start first he, he, sure the 47. he was not touched, but he fell down <laughs> in a pile, didn't he? And the it fan did. said, oh, you missed that call, Mr. Fisher. They <laughs> put those uh, punters through acting school at least a couple of weeks prior to the season. Yeah. He tried his best. Auburn will start first down at the 47-yard line. That was a 37-yard punt for Garrett. Dropman the quarterback sends Bird and Robbins wide right. Franklin wide, or rather wide left. Franklin is wide right. Ribs and Brooks behind Charlie Trotman. Two minutes to go here in the third quarter. They give it inside. Fake it. Trotman pitches to Brooks at the 45 across the 50 and into Georgia territory across the 45. Down, let's see where they mark him out of bounds. They'll mark him out near the 43. If they do, that'll be a first down. See what pressure they put on you. Charlie comes out with that thing, fakes to Joe Cribbs inside, then operates down the line and then pitches to James Brooks. That's a that's a lot of things to ask the defense to do. You know? And it was really tough because uh, he rolled uh, Cribbs into the line of scrimmage about three yards before he kept the ball. Nate Taylor and Dale Williams made the tackle. That's that same short side option in the same part of the field, really, that Auburn scored on the 66-yard run by Brooks just a couple of minutes ago. I have James for 11 carries, 159 yards. I have Joe for 20 and 133. I'm sure we're going to have to straighten all this out because we believe that there was a discrepancy in the yardage that some of uh, Brooks' yardage was, some of Cribb's yardage was given to Brooks. I think they amended that later on. Well, so did. You're, you're right. Rate, oh, Brooks good. gets oh. 10. It's first down Auburn at the 43-yard line of Georgia. That's why I was eating a hot dog. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> Atkins and Robbins wide left. Franklin wide right on first down. Now Trapman going to change his signals at the line of scrimmage. High formation behind him. He gives inside to Cribs. 40, 35, and knocked down at the 35-yard line is Joe Cribs. Eight quick yards for Cribs that time. Knocked down by Pat McShay, the right defensive end. And Auburn finding some creases in that Georgia defense that was playing on, on a lot of emotion earlier. Well, I recall on the Sky Riders tour this year, a lot of the writers got Joe Cribbs and James Brooks around and said, what would you guys like to accomplish this year? They looked at one another, and one of them said sheepishly, well, it'd be nice if we both gained 1,000 yards. I think they've gained 1,000 yards today. Very close at any rate. Brooks is over 1,000. Auburn up second down two at the Georgia 35-yard line. Trapping with split backs behind him. Wants to throw. Has a man. Robbins, 35. Robbins at the 30. Robbins on his feet at the 25, and down he goes inside the 25-yard line. It's a first down Auburn at the 24-yard line. Again, Pat McShay ran him down to make the tackle. Charlie Trotman has come on throwing the ball very well now, and it's really made a difference. You can't keep that little guy down long. You know what? He keeps coming back at you. He's a player. Auburn. Auburn is up first and 10 at the 24 yard line. Atkins and Robbins are wide right. Franklin wide left. I backfield for Trappin on first down. Give to Cribs. Cribs across the 25 to the 20 yard line before being knocked down. 
Another four in the ledger for Joe Cribbs. It's second down six, Auburn, at the 20-yard line of the Georgia Bulldogs. 50 seconds to go third quarter, and it's been a third quarter when Auburn has really dominated the play. You may recall on the uh, football review this week, uh, Coach Doug Barfield said, you know what, I, I think uh, we're not getting the ball to Joe Cribbs enough. Well, he's carried it 22 times today, so he must have thought about that ride back to Auburn. <laughs> Bird and Robbins wide right. Again, a wide out left side also. No tight end for Auburn. They are up on second down six at the 20. Trotman wants to throw. Pressure's on. He gets away. Now he gets his pass away. It's incomplete. I don't know who he was throwing to. The Georgia man, Scott Werner and Jeff Hip. We're both back there. Hip got his hands on the ball, and it went right between Bird and Robbins. I think he might have bounced off Mark Robbins after it was deflected. That brings up now third down seven. Clock is stopped. 20 seconds to go third quarter. Third and seven. Auburn with the ball at the Georgia 20-yard line. Atkins will come wide right. Franklin wide left, and Robbins is wide right in the slot on third and seven. Drop him with the eye backfield behind him. Now he's going to change his play again. Blitz is on. He comes on the option. Pitch to Brooks. He's at the 25. He's at the 20. Stiff arms a man at the 15 or at the 18. And down at the 17-yard line is James Brooks. Brooks strung out the pursuit and got what he could out of that play. He is going to be well short of first down yardage. Eddie Weaver, the left guard, chased James Brooks down out there. Eddie Weaver is very mobile for an interior lineman. And now Auburn takes a timeout. Timeout on the field with a score. The Auburn Tigers 23, the Georgia Bulldogs 10. George Portella is on. If he did, indeed he does kick this, he will be attempting a field goal of 34 yards from the right hash mark with the win. They get a good snap. Kick is up. It is long enough. The kick is good. Timeout on the field with the score. Auburn 26, Georgia 10. Two seconds to go third quarter, so if they return this, we will be at the end of the third quarter. Kickoff is high and going to be taken by Lindsey Scott at the 1. Across the 5. He's at the 10. He's at the 15. He's at the 20. 25 and knocked down as he crossed 25. Fumble the ball again. I think Georgia got it back this time, back at the 25-yard line. Georgia coughing that ball up freely here in the third quarter. They got it back, and that's the end of the third quarter. With the score, the Auburn Tigers 26, the Georgia Bulldogs 10. We move to fourth quarter action. Georgia up first and 10 at their 26-yard line. After the kickoff, Pyburn has him up. Wide out to either side. He's straight back to throw. Has a lot of time. Finds Simon at the 25. He's at the 30, at the 35, still on his feet, and knocked down at the 36-yard line. Play gained about 10 yards. It depends on where they mark him down as to whether or not he got the first down. It appears that he does have the first down. Well, let's see. They're going to bring the chains in. Maybe they are. They are going to bring the chains in. He got exactly to the 36, and the line of scrimmage was the 26. And again, Pyburn found that back out of the backfield. Still a lot of time to go in this game, Mike. Yes, there really is, and I think that's a very uh, good call on that first down. The uh, linebackers for, uh, on the part of Auburn had good drops uh, in position to make a play, but then it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation uh, with uh, back out of the backfield against the linebackers. That yep. was a 10-yard gain and a first down for the uh, pass from Pyburn to Matt Simon. Our position here, we can look through the glass. To the right side, we see the Georgia coaches in the press box on the left, the Auburn, and right now, the, the smiles are all to the left, as you might expect. Double wide outs right, some movement in the line. Womack gets the carry and is knocked down by Freddie Smith and Edmund Nelson, or Danny Skutak. It looked like some movement in the offensive line for Georgia that time, though Tim Morrison apparently came off the ball a little bit too soon. In the past, we've seen Auburn hurt themselves with penalties offensively more than anybody stopped them. Today, Georgia has hurt themselves offensively with penalties. They certainly have. They have really hurt themselves uh, with penalties and, of course, the turnovers here in the second half. They have really uh, hurt themselves. Penalty moves the ball back to the 31. It'll be first and 15 for Georgia at their 31. Defensively now, we've got Sco uh, Skutank and uh, Smith in at linebacker. Tim Wood is at the right defensive end, and Dan Dickerson at the left defensive end. Cap Arnold and Lindsey Scott come wide right. They also have a man wide to the left. Split backs behind Piper, and he's straight back to throw. He has time. Dickerson now pressures. He has Carmen Prince at the 34-yard line. Prince gets away at the 34 and goes down at the 33-yard line. Finally, host of Auburn tacklers there. 
Daryl Wilkes was there first, then Freddie Smith and Frank Warren and uh, Jim Mc James McKinney all came over to knock him down. Play gained only two. It'll be second down 13 now at the 33-yard line for Georgia. Prince was really hit. He sure was. They had a couple of guys zero it in on him when he got the ball. Come on. George up now, second down, 13. They send Amp Arnold wide left. Lindsey Scott wide right. High backs behind Pyburn this time. Pyburn with a long count. He is straight back to throw once again. Has a lot of time. Looking deep. He's going for the home run ball. He's got Lindsey Scott at the 30. It is overthrown at the 20-yard line. Darrell Wilkes was a step behind Lindsey Scott, but Pyburn threw it a step too far. There's a flag on the play in the area of the offensive line. And Georgia is retreating. Frank Warren was being blocked by Tim Morrison, and that is the area where the flag was thrown. And now Morrison appears very disgusted. We'll wait and see what the call is. They give us the call now, personal foul against, let's see, he started to point toward Georgia. Personal foul on Georgia is the call. And so, if Auburn does accept that major distance penalty, the walk-off will move it back inside the 20-yard line. The key right there was Jeff Pyburn had plenty of time to throw the ball. He's got a strong arm. We're going to have to get some pass rush, or that guy will hit one of those bombs in a minute with the speedy guys he's got to throw to. Personal foul moves it back to the 18-yard line. That brings it up second down 28 now for Georgia at the 18-yard line. Simon is out at the tailback slot. We'll have to see who checked in. They send Russell and Arnold wide left and Norris Brown wide right. Carmen Prince is also in the backfield with Womack behind Pyburn. Now Pyburn taking a long time to set his play. He is changing plays at the line. Taking a long time. Now he's straight back to throw again. He is looking. It is incomplete interference will be ruled over against the Auburn defender. Johnny Green interfered with Norris Brown. He just mistimed his defensive play that time. He had good position and just mistimed it by a split second there, Mike. He did. He hit him a fraction too early and a good call on the part of the referee. Will that give them a first down? That will be an automatic first down, I that believe. That is a very damaging play because it was second down and a mile, and the interference call gives them the first down. So they were second and 28, and they now have first and 10 at their 27-yard line. 13-11 to go in the game, 26-10. to 10. Auburn leads, Georgia with the ball. Jeff Pivert has gone all the way. Buck Ballou, the starting Georgia quarterback, was injured on a safety on the first play. Georgia had the ball when Frank Warren tackled him in the end zone. They actually moved the chains five yards the other way and award a first down, isn't that strange? Arnold wide left, Scott wide right, Georgia up on first down. Again, they appear to be audibly. Pyburn back to throw, looking. He has his pass and throws it out of bounds. He's looking for Lindsey Scott again, and Dan Dickerson and Johnny Green had coverage in the flat. And so Pyron wisely just threw the ball away. Second down, 10 at the 27-yard line. Auburn fans celebrating across the way now. 13.07 to go in the game, and Auburn leading by 16 points. Georgia with the ball. I don't think it's time to celebrate. <laughs> a lot could still happen. The way that guy can throw the football, he's got a strong arm. Anything can happen. Amp Arnold wide left. Scott wide right on second down, 10. He's back to throw, fakes a draw, has a lot of time. Now pressure's on, he gets his pass away. It is tipped incomplete. James McKinney had it go in and out of his hands at the 40-yard line of Georgia. McKinney is upset he mistimed his lead because James McKinney had a touchdown if he picks that one off. He saw the play coming from his center field position as they looked for Lindsey Scott over the middle, and McKinney just mistimed by a fraction. Third down, 10, Georgia at the 27-yard line. Not really much behind that uh, throw on the part of Pyburn. And a great ball to uh, potentially intercept. McKinney almost have it, but then didn't come, quite come down. Brown is wide right. Scott and Arnold are wide left. Carmen Prince and Womack behind Jeff Pyburn. On third down, 10, he's straight back to throw. Trying to set a screen. Now he's looking deep. He's got a man down there deep. Scott at the 50. He's at the 45. He is down finally at the Auburn 40-yard line. Lindsey Scott cut it square across the middle, caught the ball at the 50-yard line, and ran it down to the Auburn 40 before finally being knocked down by Danny Skutak on the pursuit. That's a Georgia first down, another third down conversion. They have it, first and 10 at the Auburn 40-yard line. Again, it was just a matter of Pyburn having all day to, uh, to uh, find his receiver. Not much pressure on the part of Auburn's defense. Arnold goes wide left, clock running, 12.35 to go in the game. 
Scott is wide right. Eye backfield for Jeff Piver. They give inside to Womack. Running room at the 40, but he's knocked down on a shoestring tackle by Freddie Smith. Oh, boy. He might have been gone to the races had he slipped that tackle. Freddie Smith just grabbed a knee and hung on. Play game three, second down, seven. The ball just outside the Auburn 36-yard line. And they're starting to get cranked up again here. It got quiet during the third quarter, but it's cranking up again as Georgia senses a possible comeback. Arnold is wide left. Lindsey Scott is wide right. 12 minutes to go in the game. Fiburn, quick pitch to Simon. Simon rolls to his left across the 35 and knocked down at the 33-yard line. Boy, that Bob Harris came up and made a play, didn't he? Yes, came sir. up from that cornerback and nailed him. Play gained about three after a long run. They ran from the right hash mark all the way around to the left hash mark on the sweep. Auburn Tigers lead the Georgia Bulldogs 26 to 13. A 13 point advantage now for Auburn as Georgia just moved from their 26 yard line close enough for Rex Robinson to kick that 49 yard field goal down to the Auburn 32. He, Auburn has a great kicker but so does Georgia. He is an outstanding kicker. He has a stronger leg actually than George Patella. Robinson is on to kick off. Is it too early for the onside kick? 11-12 to go in the game. Auburn has dominated the second half except for that drive of 42 yards Georgia just put together. Brooks is deep for Auburn and Auburn is cheating up. They expect a short kick it appears. Here and it they're going to get it. Auburn, Georgia shifts everybody to the left side. Robinson kicks it high in the air. It is caught and funneled on by a defensive lineman up there and we'll check and see who made that heads up play. Boy, what a play. Keith it was Keith Euchre from Hollywood, Florida. Caught that high bouncing soccer style kick and had no visions of running with it. He fell on top of it as soon as he play. caught it. What a play for a tackle to step up there and make the play for you. Handle the football. If he hadn't touched the football this year. That's a great play. You're right. And he didn't hesitate uh, charging that ball because uh, had it hit the ground it was anybody's ball. What a play. Auburn has it at the 48 yard line. First and 10. Good field position for Charlie Troppen. They split Cribs and Brooks behind him. He gives inside. James Brooks across the 50 and down to the 48 yard line before being knocked down. Mike? Peoples again. Is it Peoples? They slipped Peoples in again. They sure did. George Peoples in with Joe Cribs now. And Peoples gets three from the 48 to the Georgia 49. Gain of three, second down seven. Franklin wide right. They have Robbins and Atkins wide left on second down seven. Charlie Troutman with an eye backfield behind him. 10.40 to go in this ball game. Auburn with the ball on a 13-point lead. They give inside to Joe Cribbs. Cribbs surges forward to the 44-yard line before being knocked down. Went right up the middle that time. Good power running to the 44-yard line. Play gained five, and that will bring up a third down situation for Auburn. Third and two. The ball at the Georgia 44. You got to hand it to Auburn. They've uh, got all this uh, yardage on the uh, ground with no tight end. Power eye offense now. They're going to grind it out on third and two. Dubose and Brooks check in. They also check the tight end in. It's Keith Euchre on the right side on third and two. They give to Cribs. No, Trotman down the outside. Going to keep it. Pitch to Brooks. 40. He's at the 35, 30. He's at the 25. He's at the 50, 10, 5. Touchdown. James Brooks did it again. Touch feet. And again, Charlie Trotman strung it all the way out to the sideline. And James Brooks just took it right in front of the Georgia bench all the way down the sideline. What a gutty play that was, too, Paul Ellen. That was a gutty play. They set that thing up. They thought they were going to come inside, and, and they threw it outside to him. That was a call play for the yes, touchdown. Sir. 21. They, they sucked everybody inside side on the fake to Cribs and James Brooks and Charlie Trotman came out there with one man to beat and they beat him. 40 what 42 yards 44 yards on the run by James Brooks. It is James Brooks who goes over the 200 yard mark today against Georgia. 52 yard drive for Auburn Portella on to attempt the point after now from the hold of Foster Christie and they haven't placed the ball yet. 9.58 to go here in the ball game. Christie will hold. Portella will attempt the point after. There's a snap. Kick is up. It is good. Kick is good. Time out on the field. The score, Auburn 33, the Georgia Bulldogs 13. Thirty-three to thirteen. Hyburn has Georgia up. 
He sends Ab Arnold wide right. He's the only wide out. Pyburn runs out on the option to the right. Wants to pitch and oh. can't. He is thrown down hard by Harris Rayburn. Rayburn comes in and just took the option away from him, threw him down right at the 30-yard line. Play loses three. Second down, 13 now for Georgia at the 30-yard line. And gentleman that he is, he helped Jeff Pyburn get up. Now they're cheering, we want Bama across the way, and they're making some noise here, as you can hear down below in Sanford Stadium. That's only about a fifth of the crowd here, but they're making a whole lot of noise. Amp Arnold moves wide left. Lindsey Scott wide right. Georgia up second down 13 to the 30-yard line. Pyburn straight back to throw. He has a lot of time now. Pressure finally gets to him. He gets his pass away, complete to Scott at the 35, back to the 30, and knocked down at the 33-yard line. Harris Rayburn came across and knocked him down. What a now it does very quickly. Good snap for Garrett. Garrett gets his kick away. It is a long, low spiral. Cribs is going to field it at the 17-yard line. He's at the 20, moves to his right, can't go anywhere, and is stacked up back at about the 15-yard line. Joke now Cribs leaves the game, and George Peoples checks in. On third down seven, Charles Thomas is a quarterback. Long count for Charles Thomas. He moves left. Going to keep it himself at the 40. Gets outside of the 45 and knocked down finally up near midfield. If he got midfield, he'll have the first down. He had to get to the 48. He is at the 50-yard line. That's an Auburn first down. 4-10 to go in the game. Pat McShay finally knocked Charles Thomas down, and Auburn just flexing that muscle now offensively, Mike. Oh, they really are, Paul. And uh, I think, uh, again, one of the factors in this fourth quarter, as we noted prior uh, to the game, was uh, who wanted it the most, and it's quite obvious that Auburn really desired to win this ball game coming over to Athens, Georgia. Ryan Atkins and Steve Potoman wide right. Michael Edwards is wide left on first down at midfield. 3.57 to go in the game. Charles Thomas has Auburn up. He gives it to the fullback, DuBose, and DuBose is stacked up right at the line of scrimmage. First down, Georgia, at their 23. They send Junior wide left, Russell wide right, Falk the quarterback. Minute 30 to go in this ball game. Falk is back to throw, rolling left. He's looking deep. He's going for it all out there, and Auburn is going to intercept at the 40. Coming back upfield at the 45, 50, at the 40, 45, 40, 35, and knocked out of bounds finally at the 30-yard line. That's one of the freshmen over there. It was either Johnny Cheeks or Willie Howell. I think it was Johnny Cheeks. Yes, sir. Johnny Cheeks, the freshman, made the interception at the 40 and returned it all the way back upfield to the Georgia 35-yard line. He was playing uh, the receiver on that side, Junior, all the way, Mike, and had him blanketed as he threw the ball. Great play on the part of uh, Auburn's defender. A minute 19 to go in the game. And let's see who's in now. Is it Bob Berry? Yes, it is. Bob Berry, the freshman from Atlanta, Georgia, is the quarterback. Sends Atkins and Potovan wide left. Michael Edwards wide right. Berry gives inside of the fullback. He finds running room across the 35 down to about the 32-yard line. A minute 13 to go in the ball game. Let's see. George, was that George Peoples at fullback that time? So he gets three down to the 32-yard line. Ralph Worthen made the tackle. Both sides beginning to substitute quite heavily now. Less than a minute to go in this game. Bob Berry has Auburn up. Now there's going to be motion in the Auburn line, and the whistles are going to sound. And they just came in and cheap shot at Bob Berry from behind as he went back. And now Bob is going to have a word with the man who came in and hit him. Auburn's going to catch a penalty. Will Forts came in and just hit Bob Berry from behind as the play was whistled dead. And Auburn's going to catch a five-yard penalty. And Bob is up gesturing at the Georgia line, but Auburn's still going to get assessed five yards back to the 37. A lot of frustration here on the Georgia side of the field. 48 seconds to go. Auburn leads 33-13. Clock starts back after the penalty now. Second down. About 12 for Auburn. Atkins and Potovant wide left. Edwards wide right. High backfield for Bob Berry. Movement in the line on Georgia this time. They give inside to Willie Huntley. He is back across the 35 down to the 34-yard line before being knocked down. Both of these young sides. made the tackle. Go ahead, Mike. Both of these uh, teams having uh, young players in are very eager, of course, and that's the reason for these penalties in the latter part of this game. 32 seconds to go here, and the penalty will be assessed against Georgia, so that'll move it right back down to the 32. Georgia Tech beating Navy. We just get the score over in Atlanta. That'll be a big win for Georgia Tech. Second down six now, Auburn. The ball back at the 32-yard line. Barry has him up. Clock starts. 28 seconds to go in the game. This may be the last play of this football game. 
Barry fakes inside. Going to keep on the option. No, he gives it to the fullback inside. George Peoples, I think, and Peoples is stocked up. 15 seconds to go, and I doubt Auburn will snap another play in this game. Ball is marked down at the 30-yard line. It'll be third and five, and the Auburn fans down below counting it all. Three, two, one. That's it. Auburn has convincingly defeated the Georgia Bulldogs here. However, Georgia is not out of contention for the Sugar Bowl. You've got to remember, Auburn still has to play Alabama, and if Auburn were to beat Alabama, Georgia would still go to the Sugar Bowl. So the part two of the Sugar Bowl showdown comes up in two weeks over at Legion Field. That's it from Sanford Stadium now, though. We'll be back with some closing comments in just a moment. Your final score, Auburn 33, Georgia 13. This is Paul Allen along with Mike Colon back at Sanford Stadium where the Auburn Tigers have just taken a 33 to 13 victory here over the Georgia Bulldogs. It was really uh, a game of momentum. Auburn took the momentum early when Frank Warren tackled Buck Ballou in the end zone with uh, only with 10.22 to go in the first quarter. And Auburn led two to nothing. Ballou left, and that's the end of his action for the season. He separated his ankle. Auburn then uh, got the ball after the free kick following the safety, drove 55 yards, Cripp scoring on a one-yard run. And with 6.55 to go in the first quarter, Auburn led nine to nothing. Georgia really didn't, hadn't had the ball, but only the one snap for the safety. Georgia came back to dominate the second quarter, and they led 10 to nine at halftime. Time, but then Auburn came back using three turnovers, all gathered in by Bob Harris, the sophomore from Decatur, Georgia. And those Georgia boys really get fired up to play the Bulldogs. He got three turnovers himself in the third quarter. Auburn dominated the third quarter and then moved on out to dominate, really, the entire second half with the exception of one Georgia drive. So Auburn moving out to what turned into a surprisingly easy in the fourth quarter, 33-13 to victory, Mike. Yes, sir, Paul Allen. It was a great victory for the Auburn Tigers. Uh, coming into this ball game, anything could happen in Sanford Stadium against the Georgia Bulldogs. But uh, it's obvious that uh, Auburn came to play. They came to win this ball game. I think uh, coming into the game, they, Georgia was picked uh, by one or two points uh, coming in. But Auburn, I do believe, has a better team. They're, they have uh, more uh, experience than Georgia has. And it was obvious today as they control the line of scrimmage most of the day, except as you mentioned in the second quarter, but most of the day controlling it, uh, thus enabling Brooks and Cribb to have very effective days against the Georgia defense. That just about sums it up here. We'll remind you stations on the Auburn Network, the fifth quarter show will be coming up. We also remind you, uh, stations who are interested, Auburn, Alabama, JV football next week at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Admission is free for any football fan interested in seeing Auburn, Alabama, JV game. That's at Jordan-Hare Stadium, kickoff 1.30. Airtime on those stations on the Auburn Network taking the JV game will be at 1.15. Also, two weeks from now, the varsity in action again. It's Auburn against Alabama, December 1st, Legion Field in Birmingham. And we invite you to be with us on this Auburn Network station. We remind you once again, stay tuned for the fifth quarter program. Your final score from Sanford Stadium, the Auburn Tigers 33, the Georgia Bulldogs 13. This is the Auburn Football Network. All day from former players, coaches, friends, the Jordan family has asked that in lieu of flowers, donations be made to the Auburn University Foundation, Suge Jordan Fund, Auburn University, Alabama, 3284-36849. That's the address. Funeral services will be held at 2 p.m. tomorrow at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Auburn. Burial to follow at Memorial Cemetery. The body will lie in state at Frederick's Funeral Home until 1 p.m. tomorrow. That's Frederick's in Opelika. Carl Stevens of our staff, in addition to hosting the Auburn Football Review for the final 13 years of Coach Jordan's coaching career, was a very close friend. And that is why we ask him to narrate this tribute. Ralph Suge Jordan became Auburn's head football coach in 1951. During the quarter century which followed, the Tigers reached their greatest height, winning the national championship in 1957 after a 10-0 season. Perhaps Auburn's greatest years under Coach Jordan were the Sullivan and Beasley years of the late 60s and early 70s. With Sullivan throwing and Beasley catching, there were high-scoring victories over Alabama in 69 and 70, and Pat Sullivan's Heisman Award in 1971.
In 1955, WSFA-TV and Coach Jordan began the first football playback program in the Southeast. In those early years, Leroy Paul and Coach Jordan held forth on Sunday afternoons. It was my privilege to assist Coach Jordan on the program for his last 13 years as head coach, and he gave me that nickname, You're So Right, Carl. And uh, never given up. Uh, that was the... Uh, the feeling that permeated the dressing room uh, prior to the game, uh, during the half, it was uh, it's one that I'll remember forever, I'll tell you that. The last, uh, in April 1975, at a hastily called news conference, Coach Jordan announced his retirement. The magic uh, number 25, uh, 25 years as the head coach at Auburn has always been a magic number to me, and some of my closest personal friends realize that that was a magic number. And to even make it sound longer, I might say a quarter of a century. Well, uh, 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 that will be fulfilled with, uh, with the good Lord willing uh, this fall. His successor, Doug Barfield, expressed the feeling of many Auburn fans for the man he succeeded. Trustees to succeed a man like Coach Jordan, I, I tell you, to me, he's Auburn. He's everything that Auburn has ever stood for, and that's the main reason I came to Auburn was because of him and the football tradition that he had established at Auburn University. Uh, you're so right, Carl. Uh, Always articulate and witty, there was a busy speaking schedule in retirement until health reasons curtailed such activity last year. Last fall, in one of his final public appearances, we reminisced. Uh, uh, I remember some we won and some we lost. Uh, I don't think it would be a one-sided uh, situation. Uh, of course, you have to go back uh, to the beginning, and there were 25 uh, afternoons that I stood on the sideline and watched an Auburn-Alabama game. Suffering from a leukemia and chronic heart failure, Ralph Shug Jordan died at his Auburn, Alabama home early this morning. <laughs> University's all time winningest head football coach. Ralph Shug Jordan was buried today in Memorial Park Cemetery in Auburn. The man so many called a gentleman died at his home in Auburn yesterday after battling acute leukemia for four months. Funeral services were held at two this afternoon at the Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Auburn. All 250 seats in the church were full. Many stood in the aisles. The churchyard was filled with those unable to get inside and automobiles lined both sides of South Gay Street and Church Drive in Auburn. All 10 Southeastern Conference schools were represented by various officials. Many of Coach Jordan's former players were among the hundreds in attendance this afternoon. Six of the players served as active pallbearers, Terry Beasley, Pat Sullivan, Rusty Dean, Phil Gargas, Terry Henley, and Mike Neal, all coached at one time or another by the legendary Shug. The simple funeral service lasted only about 15 minutes. No lengthy eulogies were said in keeping with Episcopalian tradition and belief. Reverend Bill McLemore, who conducted the service, told the congregation that those who had gathered at the church were the sermon for Ralph Shug Jordan. A mighty fortress as our God was heard as the funeral procession made its way out to Memorial Park. WSFA will televise a half-hour tribute to Ralph Shug Jordan tomorrow night at 6.30. TV 12 sports director Phil Snow will have, among other things, interviews with some of the men who knew Shug best, his players. Attention. I will ever be grateful for, uh, to Auburn for giving me the opportunity, and I say that uh, uh, sincerely. I'll ever be grateful to all of the, the people in connection with Auburn, alumni, friends of a lifetime, who had confidence that, that I could do the job. But let me say I did the job, let's say that with the help of gosh knows how many hundreds of people thousands of people, often people that were willing to work, and I don't think anyone has ever done a job by himself, and there's no fun doing it in something by yourself anyway. You want a lot of people to help you, and I've had it.
We honor the memory of Ralph Shug Jordan on this program tonight. He was to Auburn fans the world over, and they are all over the world, their coach and their leader for one-fourth of a century. There are Shug Jordan monuments all over this campus, the stadium which bears his name. 21,000 seats when he came here in 1951. Next month, when the expansion is completed, it will seat nearly 75,000. There's the Auburn Memorial Coliseum down the street, and there are others. But that's just brick and mortar. The impact of the man on this campus will be felt as long as people come here to learn and to cheer on Saturday afternoons. Tonight, we take an all too brief accounting of the life of Ralph Shug Jordan. We'll talk to his players, his friends, his fellow coaches, and we'll hear from the man himself talk about some of those Saturday afternoons down through the years, as he was so fond of saying. James Ralph Jordan was born in Selma, Alabama. He liked playing cowboys, but he loved sports, football, basketball, baseball. The son of a railroad man graduated from Selma High School in 1927. He worked for a time to pay his way through that first year of college. He entered Alabama Polytechnic Institute. That was what Auburn was called in those days. In four years that followed, he played football, basketball, and baseball. He was his school's most outstanding athlete his senior year. Not long after graduation, he was called back to Auburn as an assistant. He became the head basketball coach. On one of those basketball trips to South Carolina, he met a Columbia, South Carolina belle named Evelyn. They were married three years later. The young couple's life at Auburn was interrupted by the Japanese bombardment of Pearl Harbor. Lieutenant Ralph Jordan participated in four major invasions. His Purple Heart was won on D-Day 1944 at a place called Utah Beach. After brief stops in Miami with the Miami Seahawks and the University of Georgia in Athens, Shug Jordan returned to his alma mater as head football coach in 1951. After a couple of lean years, Auburn football moved into national prominence. Vince Dooley and Fob James helped in those early years. Then came 1957, an unbeaten season, and the national championship. But before that final vote was in, Sam Adams, sports editor of the Alabama Journal, fearing a Midwestern block vote for Ohio State, organized a letter-writing campaign to Southern Associated Press subscribers, all of whom could vote in those days. It worked. And Sam vividly remembers that Tuesday when he called Ted Smith, the Associated Press senior editor in New York. Well, after I finished talking to Smith, uh, well, yeah, I speak to, uh, I speak to Shug. So he talked to Shug, and I don't know what all they said, but uh, Shug said, uh, said to him, he says, that's wonderful, that's great. And that was about the size of his celebration, uh, the, huh? Yeah, uh, and then, then pandemonium broke loose in Auburn. People had, had, uh, had already built floats and everything else, and everybody went crazy. They just tore up the, uh, up the town. Auburn fans came to love and respect Shug Jordan because they knew him so well. He spent an hour with them every Sunday afternoon on the Auburn Football Review with Leroy Paul in those early years and with Carl Stevens the final 13 seasons. A great friendship evolved and the familiar rejoinder, You're So Right Carl, became a part of Auburn football lore. His favorite team was the 1972 Amazons, a ragtag crew short on talent and ability. About the only thing they could do was beat you. Last fall, he talked with Carl Stevens about that team and that game in Birmingham. We made some sort of a drive there in the fourth quarter and ended up down around the Auburn 32, I mean the Alabama 32 yard line. And it became fourth down and nine. Well, we didn't have much passing attack. Uh, our running attack, we had not gained a great de deal of yardage that afternoon, so what the heck were we going to do? We couldn't throw and we couldn't run. So uh, I called for Gardner Jett, a uh, little boy that weighed about 145 pounds. He had never kicked a field goal that long. I guess it was a shot in the dark. I remember calling Gardner over. I said, this is a little out of your range, isn't it, Gardner? And he said, no, sir, I can kick it. 
Well, uh, we made the decision to go for three, and uh, this is the only time in the history of the Auburn-Alabama series, to my knowledge, that both sides of Legion Field stood up and booed uh, for entirely different reasons. The Auburn crowd stood up and booed because they felt like perhaps we had quit. We felt we couldn't win the ball game. The Alabama side uh, stood up and booed because if we kicked it, that blew the line, so to speak, which was 14 points, and that would have cut it to three. Well, bless Pat, uh, uh, Gardner Jet kicked that field goal, and then in sequence, uh, things uh, began to happen, and uh, Gant was the Alabama punter, and uh, of course, uh, two boys, Bill Newton, and uh, they blocked both of the Alabama kicks, David Langner picked both of them up. Now, both sides of, uh, on the first punt, both sides of the Alabama line made mistakes, and uh, if Bill Newton hadn't uh, blocked the Alabama punt, uh, Ken Burnage would have. But uh, The second block kick, the right side of the Alabama line corrected their mistake, but the left side didn't, so the same thing happened. Do you ever get away from 1716? Is it always with you? Uh, no, sir. It's always with me. Uh, by the way, I ran into the Greg Gant uh, a couple of weeks ago. A boy, for, salesperson for, coming for through. For those who don't know, he was the one who had the punch blocked. Yeah, and uh, he uh, asked me out to dinner, and he kind of thought over and said, well, people might think we had something going on with sauce together. <laughs> but we have lots of fun out of it, and it's uh, more, it's, it's good memories, and both of those good years, especially having played on Coach Jordan. Rush the passer, rush the passer! Oh, good score this year, this week. All right, Landman, Landman, that's the way to get off with the football. Backs, backs, run like a wild man! Wild man turned to loose. Be sharp. Be ready. Let's go. Come on. Let's run it again. He was a conservative man and a conservative football coach, but he believed in preparation, demanded total involvement by his players and his staff. My approach has always been as an individual, and I try to, uh, uh, and I do, I preach it to our football squad that it's not just another time at bats. That's an old baseball phrase, you know, towards the end of the season and you're batting 250 and what does one more time at bat mean? Well, every time you go to bat, you ought to try and put your best foot forward. You ought to try to excel because I don't guess we have too many times at bat. So uh, we don't say to them, uh, relax, uh, relaxing means uh, going to sleep, uh, languishing over in the corner in a big uh, armchair and looking at television with your eyes half open. Uh, so that's not the approach to it. Uh, and then uh, we don't like the hysterical approach where we are crying and tears are running down your cheek and you're biting your fingernails and and all uh, those sort of things. Uh, we like uh, uh, the middle of the road approach. So we try psychologically to, uh, to be slowly building up to a, a burn, an intent desire, and maybe bring it to a climax uh, about 1.30 on Saturday. Those in law times, we don't quite make it. I think uh, one of my old coaching friends uh, described head coaches uh, nowadays as sort of a chairman of the board type of coach. Uh, well, it's so true. And so you've got coaches in the press box looking down. They have telephone communication to the bench. A great many plays and suggestions are made from those people who are high in the sky and can look down and see everything. And uh, whereas if you're on the field, you just see a maze of things going on out there at ground level. not an easy way to go to school, to uh, be on a football scholarship. It's very demanding 
of a man physically, mentally, and then, of course, as the other side of his life, that uh, the scholastic end is very demanding, too. Uh, uh, the demands on the football field, the demands on, in the classroom uh, are terrific. And it's really a tough way to go to school, and only the very uh, fit, mentally and physically, are going to survive. do funny things under pressure and we all do funny things uh, with just plain trying uh, hustling uh, being devoted and uh, you you know uh, why did so-and-so do so-and-so and usually these questions come on Monday when there's been about 48 hours of study put on them and why did so-and-so do so-and-so which was look so stupid from the stand, so asinine, so dumb. Uh, those are the kind of questions that really annoy me. I guess uh, the old defense mechanism comes to a boy <laughs> and uh, some poor kid uh, had about five seconds to make a decision. And the ball does take funny bounces and the ball can make you look utterly ridiculous. <laughs> try to stay away from embarrassing a boy before 60,000 people. Uh, I find that I'm more conciliatory towards a player that's made a blunder out there. He feels worse than anyone in the stadium. He feels worse than the coach. But uh, at my age and after 39 years of coaching, I still make mistakes. And, and I've always felt and tell our boys this, uh, only the people that get out and try and work like a dog and go out on a limb for something they believe in, they're the only ones that make mistakes because if you sit back and don't do anything, you're not going to make any mistakes. Yesterday's funeral service lasted just 15 minutes. In keeping with Episcopal tradition, there were no eulogies. Mrs. Evelyn Jordan was accompanied by her children, Ralph Jr., Darby, and Susan. Susan's husband, Tom Pilgreen, and their children, Lisa and Tom Jr. Active pallbearers were former players, Pat Sullivan, Terry Beasley, Phil Gargas, Terry Henley, Mike Neal, and Rusty Dean. A man that has been present for us in a number of ways. Husband, father, brother, coach, friend. Indeed, each of us have our own special memories and sharings with this man. Though it is not the tradition in the Episcopal Church to have eulogies at our services of commemoration and commitment, it's probably good uh, that we don't at this time, because I can think of no eulogy, no sermon that is greater than the presence of you people here today. Shug Jordan touched many lives. There was a freshman class of new recruits each autumn, young men who remember him in so many ways. Coach Jordan got up and, of course, as you know, he was such a great speaker and made a, a tremendous talk. And uh, I was sitting here and then Coach Jordan and John Wayne was sitting on the other side. And uh, Coach Jordan made a great talk as he always did. And, uh, as he was coming back, John Wayne reached over and, and tapped me on, in his voice. He said, you know, kid, you got a great coach there. And about that time, Coach Jordan sat down and uh, John Wayne said, uh, you know, coach, he said, I think I might have a part in my next movie for you.
and uh, Coach Jordan just never batted an eye, and he just looked at him. He said, well, John, I come high. And when he did that, that just broke John Wayne up. But that was just the kind of man that he was. When I got knocked out in Alabama game, and I was just coming to, and I still was real shaky and unsound as far as to play football. And Coach, I saw Coach Jordan step back away from the team and come toward me, and he bent over to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hoss, we need you. <laughs> and that's all it took. Whether I was ready to play or not, I was going to play football. Did Coach Jordan ever help you along the way. You were one of the first of uh, the black athletes to come here at Auburn. Well, that's true. He, he helped me. And most of all, I got my education. And I'm doing things now that, you know, I'm trying to fill his shoes, mm -hmm. trying to teach guys to do things that, like he taught me. You know? One particular occasion, I remember, he, he talked of the about a movie we were going to see the summer of 42. And he went back to his summer of 42 and what he remembered of, you know, the war and uh, the pressure that was on him at that time and just went into, you know, a real oration about what what it was like to have been there and what, what this movie should mean to us tonight. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, then of course we went and it was an R-rated movie and <laughs> very, like very it. much uh, summer beach, <laughs> summer beaches out in California somewhere in the summer of '42. And uh, not you at all. Remember if you won or lost the ball game? The next oh, we day. won. We won the next day. Uh, Did Coach ever get on your case much? Not that much. I was kind of, you know, one of those good guys. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I was, I guess, a sophomore when he retired in '75 and. Uh, I was kind of one of those guys that stayed back and kind of low-key, you know. You hadn't been around long enough to get on his good side, huh? Right, right. <laughs> I went to see him uh, the day before he left the hospital, and he was just as sharp as ever, you know. We sat and talked for about an hour, I guess, and uh, he was comical, and just we just reminisced about old things, and uh, he was quick as ever, man. Did he tell you any story? Yes, sir, he did tell me a story. You know, we sit there and I said, Coach, you know, what is, you know, we see Brooks around the corner now and such speed, you know, and so let's reminisce a little bit and remember when I ran around at the corner. I said, what does it remind you of? And he said, slow motion. <laughs> he uh, made us proud by uh, tagging on us a label that only the 57 team, I think, had uh, uh, instance of being the same as being probably the best team that he's ever coached. I think uh, they had to be a good year that year because they had to coach us a lot so with the talent. We didn't have any talent. We just had to have all coaching. <laughs> uh, he probably did some celebrating later, but I guess right after that game, he was probably too busy being uh, the uh, gracious winner, huh? You think? Definitely. Uh, he was always a gentleman, and he installed in us to, uh, how to be good winners as well as good losers. And we, uh, and through our years, we had the luck. We didn't have to be the good losers that much. <laughs> we were playing Houston in the Blue Bonnet Bowl right after our sophomore year, and uh, Houston was just kind of really wearing us out, and we hadn't uh, been across midfield too much. And, about midway in, in the third quarter, I think we got to about there 40, maybe 39, and it was fourth and one, and he sent the punter in. And, uh, I sent him back out, and uh, we went for it and didn't make it, and so I came over to the sideline. He walked up very calmly, and he said, uh, Pat, he said, uh, you didn't understand that I wanted you to punt. And I said, yes, sir. I said, I did, but I felt like we should go for it. Well, of course, Coach Jordan could get upset with the best of them, and he got upset, and he told me to sit my fanny on that bench and not to get up till the game was over. And he took me out, and I sat on that bench right where he told me till the, the game was over, so I didn't cross him too much after that. And there were those who worked with him and who worked for him and who competed against him. They remember, too. There's one story that comes to mind. It involved the 1974 Gator Bowl win over Texas. After the game, it was a tremendous win for us, and after the game, wild jubilation in the dressing room. Wayne Hester, who is now sports editor of the Aniston Star, thought about asking Coach Durden the question, wouldn't this be a nice way to go out? Have you thought about retirement? Wayne didn't ask Coach Durden because he thought, as we all did, that Coach would go on and on until age, the age limit finally got him. A few months later, it was announced that Coach Durden had decided to retire and had made the decision prior to that win over Texas. 
and Wayne speculated about what Coach Jordan would have said and he asked him about that that night. And Buddy Davidson, our sports information director, said, Wayne, you might have had the scoop of your life. Wayne smiled and said he wouldn't have lied, would he? <laughs> Buddy, we all remember those uh, pregame reports with uh, Coach Jordan, which you did for radio. A lot of preparation for that? Well, the first time, Phil, there was a lot of preparation. I had every statistic and record on paper that I knew about Auburn in front of me because I thought we'd be needing that constantly. But after one show, I found out from Coach Jordan that he was always prepared in his mind. He knew what he wanted to say. But he didn't want me to uh, tell him what questions I was going to ask. And so as a result, we didn't need all those records and those things. He had it on top of his head what he wanted to say, and we went about it with that approach. He was so eloquent for television that you'd start trying to cut something and you couldn't. You ended up with three minutes every time. That's right. I, I knew after one show that uh, I took up the expression, the coach, I'm going to throw you the bone and let you chew it for a while. And that's the way it was. We didn't have to have but about four or five questions, and he handled the whole show. He could chew a bone. Good. He really could. Coach Jordan and I go back 30 years, better than 30 years. He was an assistant coach at Georgia, and I was a young fledgling English instructor. He was the first real name in college athletics that I ever knew. Uh, I went on a trip with the Georgia football team in Birmingham, and he uh, just went out of his way to be nice to him, and he spent the rest of his life doing the same thing. Many things come to your mind, uh, many things of a precious personal nature, but uh, this was uh, somewhat of a personal nature. Uh, uh, and it's a little light, so I'll, I'll tell it today. Uh, I was a freshman, and I didn't like to study too much, to be honest with you. And uh, I got a call to report to Coach Jordan's office immediately. So I reported uh, immediately. And I walked in, and my father was sitting there. And in the corner, of my, was my shotgun. He had my shotgun, all my shells, my hunting boots, my hunting coat, everything, a couple of fishing rods. And uh, he said, Fob, now let me tell you this. Uh, we didn't bring you down here to Auburn to give you a degree in shooting doves and catching fish and hunting ducks. We came down here for you to get an education. So that's going to stay right where it is in the corner of my office until you get your grades up. <laughs> and uh, I could tell many stories uh, like that. He was a... Uh, he made... Uh, he made football fun. He always said that someday you and he were going to sit down and write a book. You didn't do it. Are you still going to write it? I have no plans to do that, Phil. It was his story and his decision. He said he never did really think that many people would want to read about him, and I think that says something about him as a man. That's one story I'll always keep in my heart. Can you recall your conversation with Coach Jordan when you uh, told him you were going to leave and go be the head coach at Georgia? Yeah, I was even scared when I when I told him that and somewhat reluctant. Uh, I was uh, in Memphis and I called him and uh, of course we were right in the middle of recruiting. He was gracious as he always uh, was. Uh, and at the same time, he said we'll remain friends except one day a year. There have been some ding dong battles between the two of you since then. Uh, any kidding? Any uh, any psyching that's gone on through the years? Oh, I don't think so. I I think that uh, he was always pretty level with me, and I was always uh, pretty level with him. You know, we span a long time. Uh, I was just a young freshman when he came here. He was my head uh, coach then, and then he gave me my first opportunity to coach. And he was uh, I was the assistant, and he was uh, the head coach. And then then it was eight or ten years against each other, and then four or five years after he retired, where we probably became even closer. So in all of that 30 years, uh, he's always been the same, a gentleman and a friend, great coach and a great person. Coach, uh, Shug Jordan was your biggest rival on the football field. How did you two get on when, uh, when the game was over? Oh, we got along well, Phil. Uh, as a matter of fact, we got along well before the game. We stand down with the goalposts and talk about when we are going to retire and all that sort of thing. Never missed a game. Was there a little kidding that went on at that uh, sometime? Not, not at that not at that time until we'd go to leave. We'd say something like, uh, well, I hope you fumble every time or something. But uh, around a meeting and place where I'd see uh, sure quite often while we, we got on fine. We, 
I consider him a good friend and his wife both. There was one dark week, I think, just before Mississippi State uh, a couple of years ago. And I recall you saying, uh, talk to Coach Jordan during that week. Do you I sure that? did. We'll never forget that. Uh, we had just been beaten by Florida rather soundly, and a lot of people uh, were had given up on us, really. And uh, we were five and three and had to go to Starkville for the first time in 20 some years. And it was a pretty awesome task looking at us. And uh, uh, one of the most refreshing things, I just talked with Coach about the situation. I knew he'd been there before. And uh, his advice was uh, just figure out a way. He said, I know this is tough. Figure out a way to win one of these games. He said, you can do it. And uh, you do that, said everything will be fine. Well, we figured out a way that week. Our players did, and, uh, and he was right. Uh, he had been there before, and I, I won't ever forget that. And, and, and gosh, that's one of the things that just, just sticks with you, and uh, I so appreciated that. James Ralph Shug Jordan, born September 25th, 1910, died July 17th, 1980. This is Phil Snow reporting. Thank you and good night. Was elected that happy time. In 25 years, he won 175 games and produced a national championship in 1957. And he made a lot of friends. Our deepest sympathy to their families, and we'll miss them both. Trophy winner looking at is a freshly refurbished Jordan Hare Stadium on the campus of Auburn University. An impressive sight in itself. But what War Eagle fans all over are hoping that there will be an even more impressive sight on the floor of the stadium this fall when the 1980 Auburn team swings into action. Although it won't be easy improving on last year's 8-3 record, with 41 lettermen returning, the outlook for Coach Doug Barfield's Tigers is bright. Leading the Tiger charge will be Heisman Trophy candidate James Brooks, the SEC's top running back last season. James, I, I would think, would get to football a little more this year than he did last year because we sort of divided that thing evenly among he and Joe. We also have a quarterback that uh, I think will, will carry the ball some and, and do some throwing the football. Auburn's number one quarterback is junior Charles Thomas. He attempted only 12 passes last season, but was the team's third leading rusher in his reserve role, and he should fit in well with the Tiger option offense. And Coach Doug Barfield is also smiling about his defense, which returns 24 Letterman. I am really 
excited. I feel better about our defense than I felt in a long time. We've made some some slight changes in our in our direction that we're taking, and I don't believe our defense will be improved. Certainly, we need that we improved at the end of the year. We need to take up there where we left off. Not even another year of probation can dampen the spirits of these Tigers. Last year was Coach Barfield's best yet at the Auburn Helm, but if James Brooks and company have their way, 1980 will be even better. From Auburn, this is Dan Usel reporting. At Auburn, James Brooks gained over 1,200 yards in 1979. In 1980, his goal is 2,000 yards, not for his personal glory, but because he believes gaining 2,000 yards would help his team to an undefeated season and a national championship. They mentioned the name Heisman now, along with the name Brooks, as a possibility for 1980. Does that concern you at all? No, because you know, when you start worrying about that, and it, it messes up your running abilities and all that, you working as a team, you start uh, doing the thing you think is better for yourself. You know, then you, you know, that's, I'm not gonna worry about that because I figure you know everything will take place after the season, you know. You know, I let everybody else worry about that. You know, I just gonna do my thing. At South Carolina. football game with Phil Snow. Stay tuned. I forgot to do in the road, okay.